Relationships, especially marriages, are hard, and they're made exponentially harder when one person cheats on the other. The trust that you've built in that relationship is broken, and for many, it's broken beyond repair. However, what happens when one partner is open to allowing a third into the relationship? What happens when one of the partners then chooses the new woman over their spouse? Well, in this case, that choice led to a series of horrific, heartbreaking decisions that would permanently impact the lives of so many people. With all of that being said, let's get into the case. Today, we will be discussing the tragic case of the Collar family. Karen Collar was born on July 30th, 1965 to her parents, Paul and Pat Hetrick in Topeka, Kansas. Karen then graduated from Wichita High School in 1983 before attending Kansas State University. There, she met a man named James Craig Collar, who went by Craig. At the time, Craig was finishing up his senior year in engineering while Karen was a bright-eyed, eager freshman. Both Craig and Karen were described as ambitious and intelligent, both performing at the top of their classes. The two started a relationship and by December of 1985, Karen and Craig were married. Together, they went on to have three children, then 18-year-old Emily, 16-year-old Lauren, and 9-year-old Sean. Emily was born on April 8, 1991 in Colorado. Emily was known to love being outside. She loved theater and music, playing as a percussionist in the school band. She also played the drums in a rock band called Days Off with her sister Lauren and another friend. Lauren was born on May 10th, 1993 in Greenville, Texas. Lauren loved playing tennis and swimming and loved music just like her sister. She played the euphonium in the school band, which is a brass instrument similar to the tuba. In Days Off, her and Emily's rock band, she played the bass guitar. Throughout their lives, the family lived in various places across the U.S. They lived in Colorado first after Craig was offered an amazing engineering job there. While living in Colorado, the two welcomed their first child, Emily. After that, they moved to Oklahoma for a short time, then Texas, where they had Lauren and Sean, and where they moved into a nice big house and where they would call their home for many years. In Texas, Craig worked as the director in a utilities company. He was described as brilliant and hardworking. He was absolutely devoted to his wife and family. By all accounts, based on how Craig and Karen acted towards one another, they seemed absolutely madly in love. Karen was a homemaker and stay-at-home mom for the first years of her children's lives. She was described as fun-loving and creative. Not only that, but Karen was known as a devoted wife and mother. She loved her children to bits, and those who knew her and Craig said that she was basically the perfect wife. She was happy when she made her husband happy, basically waiting on him hand and foot, given that he was providing for the family. But while spending so much time at home was nice when the children were younger, after such a long time, Karen wanted to get out and do more with her time. After all, the children were getting older and didn't need as much attention from their mother anymore. So she decided to get a gym membership and work out, baking cakes and other pastries and selling them from home to afford to pay for the membership. After starting out at the gym, she quickly became a regular and quickly grew a passion for health and fitness. Before long, she started working at that gym as a fitness instructor, not only to make some extra money, but because she realized how much she loved teaching others about health and wellness. Now, back in January of 2006, Karen had met a woman named Sunny Reese, who was another personal trainer working at the same gym as Karen. The two grew extremely close, and at some point, their relationship turned sexual. This next part of the story is reported differently depending on who you ask, but I will explain both sides of how this could have gone down. According to some reports, Craig actually introduced Sonny and Karen to one another with the hopes of getting them close enough so that they would have a threesome with him. According to Sonny, Craig proposed the idea of having a threesome to Karen at some point and introducing her to Sonny was a part of trying to get that done. In other accounts, it said that Sonny and Karen did meet organically at the gym and developed a close friendship. 
Craig noticed their closeness, so he decided to ask them to do a threesome with him. It got to the point where Craig was even sending both ladies' flowers to their work. Red and orange roses for Sunny and pink roses for Karen. But both Karen and Sunny turned him down while beginning an intimate relationship between just the two of them. When this whole thing first started, Craig thought that Karen experimenting with Sunny wasn't such a bad thing. He thought that it would be a fling and that they would experiment together and maybe eventually he would be allowed in on the action. Because of this, at first, he encouraged the two women to continue their sexual relationship but he soon realized that their relationship was growing to be a lot more serious than he anticipated. Either way, by June of that year, Craig actually got a new job in Columbia, Missouri. He was now uprooting the family from the home that they had known for years and was asking them to move to this new state. Craig moved to Columbia right away that summer while Karen and the children stayed in Texas, planning to move with him to Missouri in the fall. With this move from Texas to Missouri, Craig thought that the distance would put a stop to the relationship between Sonny and Karen. Of course, though, this didn't happen. They visited each other whenever they could and continued communicating, calling, texting, and sending emails back and forth on a regular basis. By December 31st, 2008, longtime neighbors of the callers, Maria and Dawn, invited the family over to their home in Weatherford for a New Year's Eve party. They attended, but when they got there, they saw that Sonny Reese had also been invited. According to witnesses at the party, all throughout that night, Sonny and Karen were acting very, very friendly with one another. They were so close that Craig felt that it was inappropriate, especially for them to be acting like that in front of their kids. They were giggling all night like schoolgirls, spending time glued to each other's sides, and they would put their hands on each other's legs, which suggested to others that they were more than friends. Their relationship had been a big secret for so long, but now, all of a sudden, they were making it glaringly obvious to everyone around them that they were seeing each other. The way they behaved with each other really upset Craig. He felt embarrassed that Karen was acting so overtly flirty with someone else in front of their kids and all of their friends at the party, which honestly is totally an understandable feeling. Like having your partner acting flirty with someone else in front of your family and friends and especially your kids is pretty humiliating. After most people left from the party, all of this resulted in Craig storming over to Karen and telling Maria and Don that his wife was having an affair with Sonny. Maria said that it was clear that Craig was embarrassed over this whole thing. This resulted in an argument between Karen and Craig that escalated to them pushing and shoving each other. Karen then brought up that she wanted a divorce, or at least to separate from Craig. After that, Dawn stepped in and told her that her and Sonny needed to slow down and think about what they were doing. He told Karen that they need to be clear about what they want, that they shouldn't just let Karen break up her family like this. After that, Maria and Dawn told Sonny to leave so that Karen and Craig could work all of this out, saying that Sonny was making it worse by being there. After Sonny left, things calmed down a little bit more, but Karen was still not sure how she wanted to proceed. After that New Year's Eve incident, now going into January of 2009, Karen and Craig did agree to try marriage counseling, but it was of no use. Only a few weeks after that, Karen filed for divorce. She moved her bed to another room in their home in Columbia and started sleeping separate from Craig. Craig reacted by contacting all of Karen's friends and family, asking them to get Karen to reconsider and telling everyone that Karen was leaving him for another woman. Now, like I said earlier, it appeared to everyone on the outside that Karen and Craig had an amazing relationship until Karen went and ruined it by having an affair. However, according to Karen's sister, Lynn, the relationship wasn't all that it looked to be and it hadn't been very good for a long time. Karen told Lynn that Craig insisted on having sex with her every single night at exactly 8 p.m., even when she told him she didn't want to. It was expected of her either way. 
Eventually, Karen started to see it as just another chore that she was required to do around the house to keep things running smoothly. She also had a curfew. She wasn't allowed to be up past 9 p.m., having to be in bed by that time every night. Again, like I said, Craig provided for the family while Karen stayed home for most of the children's lives. Well, with that, Craig gave Karen a very limited budget and kept a close eye on every single thing she purchased. He needed to see receipts for everything she bought, even if it was just things like diapers when the kids were young and food for the family. Those were behaviors that were happening while the couple were supposedly happy in their relationship. Once Karen made it clear to Craig that she was done and wanted a divorce, his behaviors got even worse. According to one report, Craig was convinced that Karen was only filing for a divorce because she wanted his money. She was going to take him for everything he had. He was having a lot of trouble grappling with everything that was happening, so as time went on, he grew more and more erratic. By March 16th, 2009, Karen filed a battery complaint against Craig, saying that he physically assaulted her during an argument at the house. So, police got involved and took down both sides of their stories. Craig claimed that he was just innocently trying to hug his wife, but she rejected him and tried to fight off the hug. Karen claimed that he was holding her against her will, causing bruises on her arms. Because of this incident, Craig was later issued an arrest warrant for charges of third-degree assault, which was served to him at a public city council meeting. Because he did technically hold public office, being the director of the water and light for the city, his arrest and charges were highly publicized. Of course, this made things even harder for Craig. After the arrest, Karen left the house, packing up her stuff and taking the three kids with her. This caused Craig to sink further and further into his own misery. He became despondent. He was not only angry with Karen, but he also blamed his two daughters for apparently taking Karen's side. He no longer had any interest in seeing his daughters only wanting to spend time with his son, Sean. In the months that followed, Craig's behaviors grew more and more erratic. He became obsessed with Karen. He stalked her, took the air out of her tires in her car, and even installed spyware on her computer. His obsession with Karen and his poor ways of dealing with the problems he had in his life really started to affect not just his personal life, but his professional life. Craig's co-workers and his supervisors all noticed that he was completely preoccupied with his personal problems, so much so that he simply wasn't doing his job. So, by August of 2009, the city fired Craig from his job. So, not only did Craig lose his wife and his daughters, but now he lost his job. Of course, his parents and everyone else close to him were incredibly concerned for his well-being. After losing his job, he ended up moving back in with his parents in Kansas. Of course, he wasn't making any money anymore, but his parents also wanted to keep an eye on him and make sure that he wasn't going to spiral any further. His father, Wayne, would later say that he was afraid that Craig was going to kill himself. When they picked him up, Craig was just sitting by himself in the middle of his 4,000 square foot home that he once shared with Karen. According to Wayne, Karen and the kids trashed the house when they moved out and Craig did nothing to fix it. It was still absolutely trashed when they came and picked him up. Initially, after moving back in with his parents, 48-year-old Craig was ashamed. He said something like, I lost my family, I lost my job, and now here I am living with mom and dad. He had been prescribed some antidepressant medication, but he wouldn't take it. However, after some time living with his parents on the farm they owned, Craig's mood seemed to start picking back up. He threw himself into family chores at the home. He found purpose in helping his parents take care of the place, and his condition seemed to be improving greatly over the months that followed. But their hopes of Craig picking himself back up and improving his life would be short-lived. On Thanksgiving Day in 2009, Karen, Lauren, Emily, and Sonny all spent the holiday at Karen's sister, Lynn's house. Meanwhile, Sean got to spend Thanksgiving with his father at the ranch. 
However, the weekend following Thanksgiving, it was always a tradition for the family to visit with Karen's grandmother, Dorothy White. So on November 28th, Karen made arrangements to pick Sean up from Craig's parents' house in Meriden so that they could all go to Dorothy's house in Berlingame. That morning of the 28th, Sean and Craig had an amazing time together, fishing and hunting on the family's ranch. They were having such a good time that Craig didn't want this to end with Sean, so he called Karen asking if Sean could just stay at the ranch instead of going to Dorothy's. But of course, Karen said no, saying that Dorothy wanted to see her great-grandson. So while Craig went out and ran some errands that day, Craig's mother met with Karen in Topeka to drop Sean off. However, by around 6 p.m. that same evening, the Burlingame Police Station received a 911 call from a neighbor of Dorothy's to report that there was a suspicious vehicle at Dorothy's house, a red Ford Explorer that they had never seen in the area before. They saw a skinny-looking man getting out of the car, and they thought that he was there to rob a nearby tree-trimming business. Just as the officers were dispatching to the home, they received another call. This time, it was from Dorothy's life alert system, which had been activated by Dorothy, and in turn, it called the authorities for her. When authorities arrived to Dorothy's home, they immediately saw Dorothy through the window of the front porch. When they entered the home, they first found Dorothy sitting in a recliner chair in the living room, absolutely covered in blood, but she was still alive conscious, but having trouble breathing and calling for help. By Dorothy, they found Emily lying in the middle of the living room, covered in blood, but she had already been dead. As they made their way through the house, authorities then found Karen, who was lying on the kitchen floor, unconscious and barely breathing. Upstairs, they found Lauren, who was also covered in blood, but she too was conscious and having trouble breathing. She was also screaming for help. It turned out that Dorothy had been shot once in the abdomen. Karen, Emily, and Lauren were each shot twice. At the scene, they found two 23 caliber bullet casings all throughout different areas of the home. Now, after Dorothy's life alert called the authorities, it started recording everything that was happening in the home. The officers who arrived on scene were also wearing mics. In one recording, we can hear the officers trying to calm Lauren down while she asks him to hurry, saying that she did not want to die. He ensures her that they're doing everything as fast as they could, but in that moment, Lauren knew that she was going to die. So, as she felt the life slipping away from her, she told the officers that her father was the one who shot her. At the same time, Dorothy also told officers that Craig shot them. Like I said, Emily was the only one who had already been dead when officers arrived, so the other three women were taken to the hospital. However, after just a few hours later that evening, both Lauren and Karen succumbed to their injuries. Then, a few days later, Dorothy also died from her injuries. Now, going back to when officers first arrived, at first, first responders were unable to locate Sean. He was nowhere within the home, and neither was Craig. However, they soon found that Sean had fled the home unharmed and made it to a neighbor's house for help. Of course, Sean was absolutely traumatized. He saw the entire thing go down. When speaking with officers, nine-year-old Sean told them that around 6 p.m. that evening, him and his mom, Karen, were standing in the kitchen when Craig walked into the home through the back door with a rifle. This was a gun that he knew Craig had owned because he had used it back in Texas for hunting. Either way, after entering through the back door and directly into the kitchen, Craig first shot Karen. Craig then continued through the home, walking past Sean as Sean ducked down and booked it out of the home and ran to a neighbor's for help. As he was running, Sean said that he heard three or four more shots. As he was running past the house and to the neighbor, he saw his dad's shadow pass the window and continue through the home. It seemed that Craig purposely spared Sean's life as he went on his shooting rampage, killing all of the women in that home. For the time being, police were unable to locate Craig. However, by that next morning, he was found walking down a country road looking lost and disheveled. 
Police arrested him and he went in without incident. According to the Kansas Bureau of Investigation agent, when picking Craig up, he said, I messed up, I messed up. Upon looking into Craig's car, investigators found additional ammunition that matched the shell casings found in the home. They also found an unopened bottle of clonazepam, an anxiety medication, which was dated for March 26, 2009. Obviously, after seeing this horrific scene and hearing from the victims themselves about what happened, first responders knew exactly who was responsible for this quadruple homicide. Two of the victims themselves, as well as a surviving witness, all identified Craig as the shooter. There was no question about it. So, by the time Craig had his preliminary hearing, he knew that he wasn't going to be able to deny his involvement. Instead, he entered a plea of insanity. He argued that he should not face the death penalty because he snapped because of Karen's affair. And in a moment of insanity, he acted erratically and shot his family. However, in Kansas, they actually do not allow for defendants to plead insanity as a defense for their actions. They are not allowed to claim that they were so insane that they didn't know right from wrong. So, the defense had to use a different approach. After the preliminary hearing, his trial then took place by August of 2011, over a year since the brutal, horrific murder of his ex-wife, two daughters, and ex-grandmother-in-law. The prosecution argued that Craig consciously planned out this murder. He had plenty of access to multiple types of guns given that he was an avid hunter. He grabbed the gun of choice, then drove over to Dorothy's house where he knew Karen, Lauren, and Emily would all be at the same time. There was no chance that anybody would be out of the home or doing errands or anything like that. He knew that everybody would be in the home at the same time because it was the Thanksgiving weekend. So, that is why he chose that day and time to carry out the murder. He arrived to the home and he shot each target without missing as he went through the home. He had the concentration to shoot Karen and then avoid shooting his son who he did not want to harm. Then, he shot Dorothy once and then Emily twice. When it came to Lauren, he had to chase her down through the house and then up the stairs before shooting her twice in the back. He again had the concentration to pinpoint his target, chase them, avoiding the son that he didn't want to harm, and then shoot each one of them multiple times with accuracy and precision. Only a cold-blooded, calculated killer could execute this quadruple murder like Craig did. At the trial, they talked about Karen's affair, and this is really where the debate came in of how it all started. Craig and his defense team were adamantly denying that he approved of the relationship, saying that he never asked for a threesome, while Sonny who did testify at the trial, said that he did approve of everything at first. So, truly, we don't know the full side of the story because, as we know, everyone is going to have their own best interests in mind when they are testifying. But no matter how the affair got started, we do know that after some time, Craig no longer approved and wanted it to stop but Karen and Sonny continued it anyways. We also heard from Lynn, Karen's sister, as well as Karen's brother. Lynn told the courts about the mental abuse that Karen went through at Craig's hands for several years. Like I mentioned, how he expected her to have sex with him at a given time every single day, even if she didn't want to, how he controlled her finances, and even had a curfew for her. They said that after years of dealing with this, Karen finally found someone who could be her escape, someone she could truly be happy with and that person was Sonny. The defense, again, could really only argue against capital punishment, not whether or not he actually did it. They argued that Craig was mentally ill at the time of the shootings. Not necessarily the insanity plea, saying that he didn't know what he did, but that his mental health affected him so deeply that he resorted to killing his family. They said that after the affair started, Craig grew increasingly anxious and fell into a deep, deep, severe depression. He had been spiraling for months, even being prescribed anti-anxiety medications, which again, we knew he didn't take. They argued that he was so severely mentally ill that he did not have the capacity to form intent and premeditation. 
The courts heard from a forensic psychiatrist, Dr. Peterson, who said that Craig was suffering from severe depression at the time of the crime and that, quote, his capacity to manage his own behavior had been severely degraded so that he couldn't refrain from doing what he did. However, the prosecution also had a psychiatrist of their own, Dr. Logan, who said that Craig did have the capacity to form intent and premeditation. The courts also heard from the first responders who arrived to the scene who described the smell of gunshot residue, the sounds of everybody screaming for help, the sight of dead bodies, people gasping for air, and blood everywhere. It was a sight that none of them were prepared for, and some officers said that it was the worst thing that they had ever seen. I believe there was even one officer who retired early after seeing this because it was that impactful. The courts also heard from Sean, who is now 12 at the time, and said that he didn't really love his dad anymore. They heard as Sean testified about everything he witnessed, which again is something that no one should ever have to live through. He saw what was happening, took the best action he could, which was immediately running to a neighbor's house to get help. Then, surprisingly, he was able to remember a lot of what happened. He said that he was so scared that he didn't see his dad actually shoot anyone, but he heard it. He heard the shots, he heard the bodies fall, and as I mentioned earlier, he saw his dad's shadow passing the window. After hearing all of the evidence, as well as testimony from everyone involved, both sides made their closing arguments, and the jury was sent off for deliberations. The jury was now to decide whether or not Craig's mental health prevented him from being able to do this with intent and premeditation. And if that was the case, they would sentence him to life, not death. However, after their deliberations, the jury found Craig Collar guilty of capital murder, and at his sentencing hearing, they recommended the death penalty. Court at this time sentences the defendant uh, for the crime of capital murder to death. James Craig Kaler opted not to speak on his own behalf and even asked if he could leave the room to avoid hearing the victim impact statements. Chief Judge Philip Fromm ordered him to stay. I loved Grandma White, Karen, <laughs> Emily and Lauren very much. I will miss them until the end of my days. Lynn Denton spoke of her grandmother, her two nieces, and her sister. The four women brutally murdered two years ago in Burlingame, Kansas. I still want to pick up the phone and call her. <laughs> when the phone rings, <laughs> I want to hear her cheery voice say, Hi, sister. A jury recommended the death penalty for Kaler last month, but Judge Fromm had the final say. He also denied Kaler's motion for a new trial. I still replay that frightening night over and over in my mind, just like watching an old movie reel. When I get to the ending, I try so hard to rewrite it, but there is no such option. That statement, read by a representative for the Attorney General's office, came from Karen's mom, who's also Dorothy's daughter, of course, and Lauren and Emily's grandmother, a woman who saw three generations of her family wiped out in just one day. After his sentence, of course, Craig's team submitted multiple appeals. One of those appeals went all the way to the Supreme Court, saying that the defendant should have the right to claim insanity if it is applicable to their case, basically saying that every defendant has the right to a defense. However, in a 6-3 vote in the Supreme Court, it was decided in 2020 that each state has their right to set their own standards for defendants in their states. They are not the only state that doesn't allow the insanity plea. Idaho, Montana, and Utah have all eliminated the insanity plea, while Alaska limits the insanity defense. Then, Craig actually submitted a civil suit against the state of Kansas, hoping to vacate his conviction and sentence. He claimed that there was jury misconduct in his trial and that his defense did an ineffective job of defending him. They said that at least one juror actually had a personal connection to the victims in this case and shared personal knowledge that they had with at least one other juror. That caused two jurors to come to their conclusions before it was even time for their deliberation. 
They also said that Craig's son, Sean, said that he didn't want his dad to die because he didn't want to lose his entire family. However, the prosecution failed to reveal that information until the trial's penalty phase. That did not allow the defense enough time to investigate this interview and use Sean as a witness at sentencing. The petition stated, quote, but for the prosecution's error, the son's plea for his father's life would have been completely investigated and developed for the jury's consideration and their decision would have been for life in prison rather than a death sentence. However, both both times Craig sent his appeals to the Supreme Court, they were denied. This last appeal, I believe, was filed very recently and is still being considered in the higher courts, so we don't know the status of his suit yet, but I imagine they probably still won't vacate his sentence. Again, he murdered four innocent victims, including his own daughters and great-grandmother-in-law, none of whom had anything to do with the situation that upset Craig in the first place. Personally, I think that Craig deserves whatever he has coming. If that's the death penalty, then I support it. As of right now, he is still alive, obviously, because he's submitting all of these appeals, but I do think he deserves the death penalty if that's what's given to him. Not only did he take four innocent lives, but he deeply impacted the life of his only surviving child. I cannot imagine what Sean has gone through in the past over 10 years since this case took place. I'm sure it was completely traumatizing, something that he likely will never fully heal from, because how would you after seeing your entire family being slaughtered by your own father. I haven't been able to find any information on Sean after this, where he ended up, whether he lived with family members, which is what I would hope for. I don't know how he is turning out as a person, but I'm sure he just wants his privacy and just wants to live his life without people bothering him and reminding him about the worst day of his life so I can just hope that he is getting through life okay. But that is all I have for today's case. I know this was a very intense case. It was definitely hard to read through the transcript of everything those first responders had to witness as these two victims cry out for help after being shot. It's definitely not something you hear every day, but it does give you that much of a better perspective into what is truly happening when cases like this happen. We talk about the series of events on this channel, but hearing the trauma in their voices begging for their lives, it really just puts these cases into perspective to truly feel how these victims feel when they know their lives are about to end. It's just so heartbreaking. But that is all I have for today's video, and now I want to know what you all think. Do you think that Craig was so mentally ill that he couldn't control his actions, or do you think he's a cold-blooded murderer? What do you think of the affair to begin with? Do you think Craig approved at first, or was this all behind his back? Let's discuss this and any other thoughts that you have in the comments below. If you like this video, please make sure to go ahead and leave this video a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel. I put out new true crime and mystery videos every single week. Don't forget to turn that notification bell to on so you don't miss out on any of my future videos. Make sure you follow my Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and TikTok. All will be linked down below. And if you have any case suggestions, please make sure to fill out the Google form, which is also linked down below. With that, I hope you guys have an amazing week. Stay safe, stay healthy, and I hope to see you next time. Bye.